business of God as he develops us as women ministers is to conform us to the original image and the original image is the image of a son. Dr. Lucy Nanga, Senior Pastor Fountain Gate Church and Visionary Network of Women Ministers Kenya, Women of Grace, Elect Ladies and Deborah Company among others. Her passion is to empower women ministers. He said, I will put an enmity between you and them. That's where the battle is. You can still conceive a vision in your old age. God is in the business of renewing. And how does God renew? God renews by his voice. Join us as we receive the ministry of the world. In this season, we've been doing um, management of resources. That's what we've been doing. Management of resources, or you can call it stewardship. Basically, stewardship. And um, we said last time that, and I want to repeat, that God will never give an assignment without giving you the resources that will enable you to accomplish your assignment. Every time God calls you and gives you an assignment, whether it's ministry or your personal life, whatever assignment God has given you, God will give you the resources that will enable you to accomplish your assignment. In other words, and you can write this, for every vision, there is provision. Amen? For every vision. That is why everything you're doing, ask God, where is the provision for this thing that you have asked me to do? Because God will never ask you to do something without giving you what is required. And someone told us, uh, Pastor Faith actually right here, that what is his will is his bill. And I like that also. Amen. What is his will is his bill. That means if God gives you something to do, then he must give you the resources that will accompany that, um, that vision or that assignment. Uh, in fact, we read uh, in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, we say, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do. So even the desire, so the first thing, of course, starts with a desire to do, but even the will, the will to do is from God. Isn't it amazing? Some of us think that we are the ones willing, we are the ones who have decided we are so powerful, we love God, we, are, we sacrifice. Let me tell you, unless God put that will in you, even what you are doing, you will not do. That means everything you have is from God. Amen? Amen. He gives you the, even the will. Tell your neighbor, even the will is not yours. <laughs> it is from God. Yeah, so he gives you, uh, he works in you both to will and to do. To will and to do. I pray this prayer many times. I tell God, Father, help me to will to do the things that you want me to do. Because sometimes naturally, I do not want the things God is saying. So God has to create even the desire for me to will to do. Some of us, if we are asked to be pastors, I'm sure would have said no. But God now gave you a will. That's why Jeremiah says, you know, at a point Jeremiah was offended by God. And he said, God, you cheated me. Those are the words he used. And uh, remember God had spoken to him from the, from the day one that I knew you from the womb. And one time, because of what Jeremiah went through, he felt like God was not fair to him. But then he says, and he said, I will not say anything. But he says, his word was like fire in my bones. And I could not keep silent. And that is how God works in us. Amen. And we bless him. So, for every vision, there is a provision. This I'm recapping, then we go to the topic of the day. So what are resources? What are these resources? Now we use the dictionary to define, and we said resources is a stock or a supply of money, materials, stuff, or human resource, and other assets. Many people think about money only. And we will be talking about money, not today, because money is important. But there are other things that are more important than money. But stock or supply of money, material stuff, and other assets that can be drawn on by a person or organization in order to function effectively. 
The reason why God gives us resources is so that we can be able to function effectively. And money is a resource. I gave you four resources uh, last time, and I will give you money is a resource. People are a resource. Time, which we discussed extensively last time. If you are not here, please buy a CD. Time is a great resource. And then grace is a resource. And I've shared about grace, but I will revisit grace uh, sometimes in the future again because the word of God comes to us afresh every time. Amen? And grace is a resource. And we said money, money is the material resource that God gives you, material resource that God gives you to be able to accomplish your assignment. We will discuss money in our next uh, meeting. Luke chapter 16. I want you to be studying Luke chapter 16 about resource and many others that I'll give you. People are the human resource. God will always, in fact, before money, God will give you people. And in fact, you will see how you manage the people that God brings to you actually determines if you will have every other resource. Because in people is grace. Grace is carried in a human vessel. People are the ones who have money. It's very rare that God would drop money from heaven. He has done that once or twice for me. <laughs> he dropped it on the road. But rarely has he done so. Every time I need money, God sends somebody. Because God does not work in central bank. Neither does he create money. Actually, money was created by people. Therefore, money is with people. So if you know how to manage people, then you will know how to get their money. That's important. Amen? All right. People are the human resource. Time is a natural resource. Time is a natural resource. While grace is the divine resource. Grace is the divine resource. In fact, grace is the very content that God is made up of. The Bible says we beheld him, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace. And of his fullness have we received. What have we received? Grace upon grace. So in God, God contains grace. And grace is the divine material, the divine enablement. So grace is not just unmerited favor. Grace is what makes you function divinely. That's why we are saved by grace. It's a work of grace. It's the divine work. We function the things we do. We do by grace. So let me repeat that. Four resources that God has given to us to be able to, um, to accomplish our assignment. One is grace. I like, maybe you can start with grace. is the divine resource. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 7. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Grace comes in measures. By the way, even resources come in measures, except time that is fixed. We said last time, time is the only thing that is equally given to all of us. None of us has 25 hours in a day. We all have 24 hours in a day. That's why the Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 9 that, uh, you know, time and chance belong to all. It's not money that belongs to all. It's time and chance because time and chance are given equally. The rest of the things are not given equally. Grace is not equal. We don't all have the same measure. Measure is given according to your met. Uh, grace is given according to your measure. The metron, what you need to do, you are given grace. And we grow in grace. That is why there is sufficient grace. Amen? There is great grace. Amen? The Bible talks about growing in grace. All right? So grace is the divine resource. Ephesians 4 verse 7. Money is the material resource. You study Luke 16. We'll come back to it. People are the human resource. And there are many scriptures, but I'd like you to study, and we will read that today, John 17, and time is the natural resource, which we shared, please, by the CD, Ecclesiastes 3 and Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11. Today we are going to look at people as a resource. Because when you change your view, when you change your understanding, when you change your attitude towards people, you're going to tap into all other resources that God has for you. 
I'll tell you why. Let's go to Genesis chapter that I hadn't even thought about, but let's go to Genesis. I think it is chapter 2. Let me see if it is chapter 2. Not chapter 2, chapter 1, sorry. A verse verse uh, let's read from verse 31 and then we'll go to, to, to chapter 2 then God saw everything that he had made and did it was good so the evening and the morning were the sixth day after he had created thus the heavens chapter, verse two, chapter 2 thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished and on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. And we know why God rested is because on the sixth day, God created man. And from the day God created man, God rested from all his work. That means God was not going to directly, that is what it means. That resting from, doesn't mean God is not working. In fact, the Bible says we are co-workers together with him. Amen? The Bible says that we are co-workers with him. Yeah? But on that day, God rested from working directly. So God started a partnership. It's called a partnership with man. He rested, but he, st he doesn't mean he is not responsible. It doesn't mean he is lazy. He's lazing on his bed if he has a bed. <laughs> of course he has. The Bible says heaven is on my throne and the earth is my Footstool. So the earth is his footstool. But God rested because God created a man who was in his own image. Let's go to Psalms 8 and see. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? Imagine. For you have made him just a little lower than Elohim, than God himself. That's not angels, it's actually God himself. And you have crowned him with honor and with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over what? The works of your... So this goes back to creation. The works of his hand, what God created. So whom did he put in charge? Man. So what did he do? He rested because he put man in church. That means everything you need is with the man who is in charge. That's why you need to think about people in your journey. In fact, let me tell you, the assignment God has for me and for you is to bring you to a place where you are able to tap resources that are locked up in people. If you can first believe everything I need is in people. It is God who gives, but through people. That spirit of God, we, only me, I care only about God. People, I don't care, is demonic. And it actually hinders you from accessing what God has for you. I keep saying, there is a foolish prayer, my own tribe prays. I don't pray it. God come and he said no one. And I always tell people, that's a foolish prayer because God will never come. Because for God to come, he has to send someone. So you better love the someone that God is going to send. <laughs> eh? Priscilla is laughing because I'm sure she has prayed that prayer. She has even told me verbally, Gira gai, okay, nadagatuma. Sorry for those who, who don't understand that. It's a foolish prayer. It's a foolish prayer. Lift up your hand and say, God forgive me. For despising those whom you have sent. <laughs> All right, so people, let me tell you about people. People are.
are human resource. There are very few things you can do without people. Very few. Very few that you can do without people. Or goodwill from people. Let me tell you, even if you don't need people, and I don't think you don't, at least on the minimum, you need to be at peace with everybody because you need goodwill. Do you understand what I mean? Even if you don't need people per se, even those you don't need, Pastor Beth, in Kutus, the MCA, you may not need the MCA, but you need his goodwill. That is why the Bible says, as long as it is dependent on you, live at peace with all men. Why? Because you need their peace with all men. Is that clear? Yeah, so you need people. So there is very few things you can do without people or at least their goodwill. I used to be one that didn't really care much about people, but I've come to know I need goodwill even from my enemies. I need them. That's why, by the way, let me tell you a trick. Keep your enemies close. Some of us, as soon as it's an enemy, you delete their number. No. Keep your enemies close. You need them. At least you know where they have kept the kimindo. They are going to stab you with. <laughs> from behind. At least you know when they are going to strike, isn't it? I was telling, uh, I can't remember, I was preaching and I was telling pastors, even in your church, you know those troublesome people? Those who you always are against, at least talk to them. You'll know what they are not happy with. You'll be able to control them. As long as you let them loose, they are going to destroy a few other things. So anyway, people are important. Now, God has also created us as human beings to be relational. That's why we must work on relationship. I didn't understand that. And my husband has really tried to help me. And I thank God for him. Relationships are so important. Are so important. You can have all the money you need. You can have all the cars you need. But without people, it will not help you. Can you imagine if you go to a hotel? I don't know about you, but if you go to a hotel and you have money and order food alone. I have tried a few times and I was so frustrated. I would rather be a DNR. What do you call that a hotel? I'd rather be a DNR with Helen, taking a cup of tea that costs maybe, I don't know how much that one costs, 30, 40 shillings. It's very cheap. Than be at Kempiski alone, taking their tea. The same tea, by the way. When you think the important, it's the same tea, Kericho Gold, the same milk from the same farmer, be taking that cup of tea that costs a thousand. That's how important people are. Let me even help the married. Let me tell you, work on your marriage. Usifikiri ya tikuwe, we, wacha ni kwambi. Utakuja kujua uyo mutu is more important than I am telling you. You look at me, but you come to discover having company is better than anything else you are looking for. So, relationship. Because God, and we are created in his image, is relational. God is relational. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. When God created, he created everything. But the only creation he visited was man. God, God in fact, can you imagine? This is the way God did. God created everything, then put a man in charge, but the only relationship God has was with a man. He gave power to man to do what he wants. That is why when we destroy environment, that's why we need to be engaged, by the way, in environmental issues as a church. Because the environmental issues actually do impact. Do impact us in a great way. Sometimes we don't think about it, but they do. Because we are in charge. So that's why the rain doesn't come on time. 
You know what happened to Mozambique the other day? All these things are disaster because man is not managing the things God gave him to manage correctly. You remember the person who was saying we move the rivers? <laughs> we, we, move, we move the river. We are not managing correctly. You know, constructing houses where there shouldn't be, all that. But God is, has given us the power and God has nothing, so to say, with those things because he already gave us. So the Bible says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Bible says in verse 9, go to verse 9. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, because God was used to fellowshipping with them. And he came to talk to them in the cool, in the spirit. It's called the work of the day. Why didn't God come? And God did not even come to ask them about the, even the sheep and the goat and everything. God gave man power to name. He didn't name them. And the Bible says whatever he named them, it was so. So God came to fellowship with man. Not with the things that he has created. And you know, so many of us are not building relationships that we should build because we are so busy making money, looking at the things and not the people that God has put in our lives. Amen? Say, may the Lord help us. Yeah, yeah including our children, my friend. Let me tell you, I always admire people who have younger children. And I want to encourage you, build relations. Those children need you more than money. I am telling you. Those children need you more than money. They need you more than money. In fact, they could do without money, but they can't do without you. Relationship. So God came to fellowship with them. Second Corinthians six one. Let's read Second Corinthians six one. Second Corinthians six one. The Bible says in Second Corinthians six one, we then, as workers together with who, with Him. So God can't even work alone. He has to have people. We then, as workers, we are co-workers together with God. Now look at this. Jesus, who is our patent son, also needed people. He had, he had to have people to accomplish his assignment. Let's read. Uh, there are many verses, but I'll read a few and then I'll read others. Let's read John 18, verse 9. John 18, verse 9. John 18, verse 9. Okay, maybe verse 8. Let's try verse 8. Verse 8. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let this go their way. Verse 9. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you did what? I want us to read loud. Of those whom you, you gave me, I have lost none. And we'll come to that because many of us are losing. By the way, God never gave him money. His money was with those whom God gave him. For example, his money was with this, the women in Luke chapter 8. They provided for him. His food was with Mother and Mary and Lazarus. So what God gave him were people. Those whom you did what? So as we live today, I want you to define whom has God given me. And therefore, with all your energy and with all your strength, you're going to keep those whom God has given you because in them is everything you need. In them. And we'll come to Jesus and how he dealt with the people that God gave him. But as you go, read John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is the one that summarizes the people that he gave him. But go and read. We may also read it. Let's read Mark 3. Mark 3, 13 to 14. Just laying foundation, we'll still read. Mark, if you can get this, and the day I started to get it, I'm not there, but the day I started to get it, I focused on people. I'm not a people person per se. You know, there are people person. What do you mean by people person? It's like Helen. She just thrives where there are people. 
and you don't need to be a people person to know how to relate with people because you can't change yourself. Amen. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself did what? Wanted. This is the point I'm making. For Jesus to accomplish his assignment, he also, he needed people. He needed people. Let me show you the people in Jesus' life. One was his disciples, 12 of them. Amen. So first he had three. He had John, James, and Peter. He didn't, he didn't even call Andrew. Because you know, Peter is a brother to Andrew. And, and uh, James is a brother to John. But in his call three, Andrew is not there. Because even though God wants you to relate with people, you must know how to relate with different people. Amen? Amen? And all are important. Jesus had three. He didn't call everybody to go to the mountain of configuration. He went with the three. And he was very close with the three. And I will show you how the three behaved. In fact, Peter at a point was very upset with John. Yeah? And that's okay. That's normal. Jesus had three. Jesus had 12 disciples. Jesus had 72. Jesus had the multitude. And all of them were important. So the disciples. Jesus had uh, ladies that were in his ministry. Amen? Luke chapter 8. Let's go to Luke chapter 8. These were important ladies. They are even named. And they were important. Some of us don't open up. And by the way, for you to be able to relate with people, you must open up to all kinds of people. Even those that you think are bad. Like Mary Magdalene had seven demons. Yes. Some of us have already put away people because of their demons. You know, you rub shoulders with them until the demons come out of them. Now it came to pass after that he went to every village, every city and village, preaching and bringing glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And who was with him? How many? Twelve were with him. Verse two. And also who? Who had been? Of what? And these were not his disciples, but they were also with him. Mary called. How many demons had he cast from Mary? Seven. Can you imagine? But they were part of his camp. And it's the same Mary Magdalene who proved to be so loyal yeah. to him. Yeah. Open up your eyes. Open up every, let me tell you, every need you have in between, there is someone that you need to discover. That God needs to open your eyes to see. Now the problem is some of them come full of seven demons. You know, seven is the number of perfection. That means she was perfectly possessed. <laughs> you know what the Bible says? If a man who has a clean house, when a demon leaves a house, what does it do? It goes to look for how many more? Seven, Seven more. So Magdalene was perfectly possessed. In fact, do you remember how many times they complained who he ate with? In fact, they say he eats with sinners. Some of you, you've never, never, never even gone near bar. Let me tell you. And one of your main, 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 main supporter of ministry is still in a bar. But you are so holy, you have never passed through there. I'm telling you. Jesus, in fact, they call him a wine viper. That's why John did not succeed. Because he ate locusts and he was in the wilderness. They cut his head while Jesus, even Herod's wife, became his friend. What about the one who crucified him? It is the wife that was deterring him. That man is not evil. That means Jesus had connection with the wife of the great people. But us, what are we doing? We are cursing them, killing them. Killing your MCA, <laughs> killing your MP. Cursing president, cursing Ruto, cursing everybody. You're cursing everyone. That's what we do. Jesus was so connected when he died. One, of, one, when, one on his way 
Simon, not the 12 disciples. Simon, they call him the Simon of Cyrene. What did he do? He carried his cross and who buried him? Joseph of Arimathea. So where is Joseph in the 12 disciples? But you, you are only stuck with Deborah's. We are Deborah. If you are not a Deborah, I have nothing to do. Who will bury you? You need Joseph of Arimathea <laughs> to provide your tomb. I tell you, you have to learn to relate with people. I want to remove religion from your head. You only pray with those who, who go with you for cashers. Visit one who doesn't come for Kesha to find out why they don't come for Kesha. I'm telling you, it's a mind opening how Jesus was, as a son of God, was able to relate with all these kind of people. That's why, first of all, we have to really open up beyond our ministries, appreciate people, even if they have a different style of doing. It takes grace to do that. I was telling the saints how someone the other day came to tell me I be their mother. <laughs> but as I looked at them, I knew who you, who you ni mutu wa But then in my heart, I was yeah, oh, mother, you are remove those seven demons out of you. If you agree. We have to come to a point where we are not judging people and casting them away. Give them time. Of course, there are ways to get into those people. And Joanna, who was Joanna? The wife of, so the first one was a seven demon possessed woman. The second one is Joanna the who? Who? Herod Stewart. Jesus was able to access Herod Stewart. You know who is Herod Stewart? The one who was in church. A steward is one who has the responsibility of distribution, accountability, management. I've taught you that. I won't repeat Herod steward. The same Herod he calls, go and tell that fox. He must have sent it. <laughs> he must have sent Joanna <laughs> to tell that fox. Yeah. Do you understand? Yes. He was able to access the palace through a woman called, I pray these women will come my way. I see them. I call them. But my eyes have to be open to see them because maybe some have come on me, but I put them away. And Susanna and many who did what? Provided for him from their substance. Because these disciples were so poor. Even when he wanted tax, they are so they say, we don't even have money. He said, go to the fish. If these women were there, they would have just gone to back to their bags to provide for him. He had Mary and mother. He was so free with them that they can ask him. They, his disciples would not ask him the question Mary is asking. Where were you? You know why Mary had a, a right to ask him, where were you? Because they had relationship with him. He ate at their place. He joked with them. So if Jesus needed people, who are you? Who are you? That you live alone. You are a loner. You are self-contained. I refuse to be self-contained. <laughs> By the me, I'm one that can really try to be self-contained. God has had to teach me I am not self-contained. <laughs> There's still something I need from someone. Do you know why you are not complete and have weaknesses? Do you know why? Do you know why? It's so that those spaces, God can bring other people to fill up those spaces. Now, write this. It takes humility. It takes humility. It takes humility to depend on others. It takes humility. Humility. By the way, that's why the Bible says, humble yourself. It takes humility. Humility. Because, look at me. Every time you accomplish something on your own, you are likely to become a proud person. Yeah. 
In fact, write this. All these are not written. God wants me to depend on others. God wants me to depend on others so that I can be humble. And the relationships we are talking about are not just individual, but even corporate. There is a place the church will come, different local houses, I call them local houses because there is no one church that is complete. There is a place where God is bringing us where you will truly depend on the church down the road. You know that pastor that has nothing, that has no shoe, God will make sure that there is something we need from that pastor. Because the body is only complete when all the members are there. Amen. I'll show you that later. This is just, tell your neighbor it's just preamble. <laughs> all right, but I need, I need to go fast. All right. You know, there is an African proverb. I told you last time, but I will tell you again. There is an African proverb that says, it says this. If you want to go fast, go alone. Write it. If you want to go fast, you know, you want to be ahead of others, go alone. You'll be very fast. You go alone. But if you want to go far, walk together with others. Okay? Because this is what happens, and it's natural. We're still coming back to the scriptures, don't worry. But all wisdom is given by God. It is very natural. If I am doing something alone, I may go fast because nobody is derailing. In a team, people have different ideas. And it is easy to kick them away because you feel like the ideas may not be as good as yours. Now, the problem is you will not go far. You will only go fast. Going far is different from going fast. Many of us are going fast, but we may never go far. But if we walk together, we may walk slow, but we will go a further distance. That's enough. Tell your neighbor, that's not Bible. It's an African proverb. <laughs> yeah. If you go fast, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Go together. Write this also. Individualism. Individualism is an enemy to your progress. Individualism. Individualism is an enemy to your progress. Why are people important? I'll tell you. One, because grace, I had said this, but just right, grace is carried in people, human. In fact, human officiation, human officiation is required in everything. Human, there is a human being in, every, in everything. Human officiation. So grace is carried in human vessel. Unfortunately. Two. Mantos. Because grace is also mantle, but really it's a bit different. Grace is carried in human vessels. Mantle, giftings, anointings are carried by people. That's why giftings, for example, are imparted from people. Paul tells the Romans, I long to come and see you so that I can impart spiritual gifts. Paul tells Timothy, start up the gift of God in you by laying on of my hands. That means whatever gifting Paul had, he was able to impart it in, Paul, in, in Timothy. So what I'm saying, grace is carried in people. Mantles, giftings, anointings are carried by people. Money does not drop from heaven. It comes from people's pocket. And I already said human officiation is required. Look at David. David is a very good example. God says, I have found for myself. I have found for myself a man that is after my own heart. But yet, there has to be 
Samuel in the middle. In fact, Samuel has to come in between. Remember, if you remember the Bible, the way it is written, you go, you leave Joshua. Joshua never passed the mantle to anybody. So we come to Judges where they had so many rulers and they did what they wanted because there were no rulers among them because Joshua died with a mantle. But at the end of Joshua, a woman called Naomi and Ruth has to come in in the middle. Human officiation. And the Bible says at the end, he gives the genealogy of David. But before we have to find David, there is another woman called Hannah that has to bring a boy called Samuel. And Samuel has to take over in between because he's not a full Levite. He's an Ephraimite from, from, from Eli who could not accomplish the work of God. Let me tell you, God cannot do without a man. Let me say that again. God cannot do without a man. God can do without you. <laughs> that is different. God can do without you. But God will always seek for another man to replace you. That's what I mean. Do you understand? Yeah. So Hannah has to come. Samuel has to come. But what is God looking for? A one boy called who? David. David cannot anoint himself. He is anointed first time by Samuel, second time by his tribe, and third time by Israel. Why? Because human officiation is required. Let me ask you, Jesus himself, when he goes to John, he says, baptize me. And John says, I am not even worthy to untie your saddles. But he says, no, you must baptize me so that all oh, I can fulfill all. Let me tell you, all righteousness had to be fulfilled for Jesus. And as God as he was, he had to bow down. To John. The Bible says, I will send my messenger before time. Why didn't God just bring Jesus? And the ultimate was Jesus. When John shows, sees him, he says, this is the one. I am not the one. But why did John have to come? And Jesus has to bow to who? To who? To be declared as what? As a son. You cannot do anything. In fact, the main undoing for John was because he disconnected from Jesus. In fact, the main undoing for John was that he was such a good prophet. And in fact, I think John and Elijah has the same character because even Elijah says, I have no other. I, I, I. In fact, I like the way God keeps asking him, what are you doing here? He says, I, even I, I am alone. God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? I, even I, I am alone. God says, okay, fine. You want to die? You will die. But before you die, divide your gifting into three. Anoint Hazael, anoint Jehu, and anoint Elisha. Then you shall go. But yet, I wanted to tell you, I had how many? 7,000. What was God telling Elijah? He was rebuking him. That he was not able to see. He was not I and I alone. Some of you think you are the one that God has called alone. No, there are others. We are not the only Deborah. Yeah. Hey, there are so many. Yeah. Ask God to open your eyes. They are there. Yeah. Maybe they are called Esther. Maybe they are called Abigail. Maybe they are called Mary Magdalene Ministry International. No. <laughs> Whatever they are called, but they are there. And look at Elijah. What does he do? He dies before his time. What about John? His head is cut. Why? Because he doesn't know how to connect. I want to know how to connect with people. Yeah, yeah. Because people are your protection, I told you. All right. Is that okay? So mantles are carried by people. Grace is carried by people. Money is in people's pockets. And mantles are generally passed from one person to another. In fact, if mantles are not passed, they go to waste. They go to waste. By the way, you will live many days to come by how much you relate with people and impart yourself to them. In fact, if there is a reason to relate with people, is to impart yourself to them. So that many days to come, there shall be a murugi. Train people, even at work. Don't be the only... You know, there are some people, when they leave a company, 
in, if you are so praised in that context, you failed. Can I say that again? Even if it's a pastor, if you are so praised that your absence will cause a big gap that no one can feel, you have failed. Even though people will miss you, and even if when you die, you are, you are, your responsibility is given to three other people, that is okay. But you must have imparted in them. In fact, let me show you how to look at people from today, especially people who are below you. Every time you see someone, think about how you can lift them. It's a way of thinking. Think about how you can lift them. Start with your house girl. Cindy, <laughs> when your house girl comes, think about what you can do to them to lift them from being a house girl. We are not starting from our place. Start there at home. What can I do to this girl? And by the way, God has brought a house girl to your life to test you. You complain about your boss at work. Cindy, you complain about your boss at work. God always brings you your house girl to test you. Whether you will lock the eggs. You are laughing, but people do that. Lock the eggs, lock the oranges. What else do you lock? <laughs> Sausages. What else do you lock? <laughs> sugar. Some of you even lock sugar and salt. Nguasame. <laughs> Let me say something else. Please write this one. Let's make fun about it, isn't it? The relationships are so important that the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments, and God didn't come to do away with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, half of them, half of them are about relationship. How you relate with God and how you relate with man. In fact, that is why Jesus summarized them in two. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and you shall also love your neighbor as thyself. That one is the fulfillment of the law. That means the Ten Commandments are all about relationships. Relationship with God and relationship with man. Let me say this, write this one. I know many will dispute, but write it. Good relationships, good relationships will help you or will help me accomplish more than 40 days of prayer and fasting. Write it, even if you don't believe it, at least write it. Good relationships will help you accomplish more than 40 days of prayer and fasting. So in fact, let me tell you, you'd rather not fast, but fix your relationships. All right. The way you relate with others, please write this. Let me be contained. The way you relate with others is a reflection of your relationship with God. How we see you relate, especially with those who are, the Bible says, of the household of faith. It's a reflection of your relationship with God. Please read John chapter 3 verse 10 and chapter 4 verse 20. First John, sorry, chapter 3 verse 10. That's why, by the way, and go and search them in the Bible, there are so many what I call one another's. The Bible says love one another, forgive one another, be patient with one another, encourage one another, visit one another, kiss can you imagine the Bible has to tell us kiss? When did you last kiss one another? Not the one of a wife, a husband and wife. Kiss them. Some of you, you are, some of us are so even, uh, what do I call it? Selfish. Even with the hug. Do you know there are some people, come Pastor Grace. But if you want to hug me, don't hug me like this. Come. If you don't want to hug me, just greet me. I hate some hugs. <laughs> Maybe because of makeup. We better do away with makeup. You know, there are some people who do like this. That's not the, what the Bible says. <laughs> I hate.
hate those ones. Sindio, mi ni kikuhag na penda gaibi. Yes, 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 yes. Now that is the holy kiss. There is a, that connection. It's very fake. In fact, let me tell you, if you don't want your makeup to be destroyed, just greet like this. How are you, my sister? It's very fake. Sometimes I feel like slapping people who do that. Don't do that to me. I've declared. Just greet me like this if you don't want your makeup to come out. I love you. There are so many. Go and there are so many one another's in the Bible. One another. Okay, all right. Now, three sets of people you need to build your relationship, and we'll look at them. Three sets of people, three levels of relationships. Let's read First John chapter two, twelve to fourteen. First John chapter two, twelve to fourteen. The Bible says, "I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, are forgiven you for His name's sake." I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong. Now, in every, at any one time, there are three categories of people. They are children, they are sons, and their fathers. Fathers are those above you. Sons are those at your level. Children are those below you. Okay? Is that correct? Let's read another one. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. All scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine. So within our church, there are fathers, there are sons, there are children. Now, these are not necessarily by age. It just means people above you, people that are the same level with you, and people that are below you. Do not rebuke, Paul tells Timothy, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as what? As a father, younger men as brothers. And within that brothers, there are those that are younger than him that are like children, and there are those that are with him. Older women as who? as mothers and younger women as sisters with all purity. So there are three categories of people you must look at. People above you, people on the same level with you, and people below you. Those above you, I want to call them fathers. And I'm emphasizing on fathers because it's not just a father, but fathers. All right? In every time, God will put fathers over your life. There is a primary father you relate with, but that does not mean there are no other fathers. They are fathers and, of course, mothers. But let's talk about fathers. Then they are brothers. And then they are people who are below you. Let me quickly, and this one I'll dictate to you, how to relate with those above us who I call fathers. God, in his own wisdom, has made sure that there is always someone above you. That is, those who may exercise authority over your life. Those who may exercise authority over your life. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Quickly, Hebrews 17, 13, verse 7. Remember, the Bible says, remember those who do what? Who rule over you. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. There are always people above you. They rule. By the way, it's okay to rule. Do you know? One meaning of the shepherd is to rule. Rule. That's why every shepherd has a rod and a staff. Thy rod and the, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me. Thy rod and thy staff. And that's ruling. Sheep need to be ruled. And many people don't like that. But those who rule over us, those who have authority over us, and I say it, they can generally be regarded as fathers. Let me show you how to relate with them. And this does not just relate, mean your spiritual father only, but fathers, those who are above us. Number one is a culture of double honor. Honor. Walk in honor. Even though we should honor everyone, 
for fathers we give double honor. First Timothy 5.3, this one I'll dictate. First Timothy 5.3, culture of honor. Culture of honor. I need to honor fathers, even though they may not directly, primarily relate with them. And I expect all those, even I shepherd, to honor all fathers. If a father came here, he has to be honored, even if we are not present. Because it's a culture of honor. Don't teach people to only honor you and dishonor others. Amen? Let them feel honored. Culture of honor. Number two, culture of obedience and submission. Culture of obedience and submission. Culture of obedience and submission. The Bible says in the book of 1 Peter, is it chapter 5? Uh, I think verse, uh, go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Check for me where the Bible says, all you younger ones, Submit is verse, verse 5. Go to verse 5. Likewise, you younger people. So you always have, and younger is not necessarily in age. Okay? There is age, yes, but there is also. Likewise, you younger people, submit to yourself. Culture of submission, and I'm dictating, I don't want to explain a lot. Culture of obedience and submission. Number three, culture of becoming a disciple or a follower. What do I mean that by that? Attitude of learning. Learning. Learning from those who are ahead of you. is a culture you develop. Every time you need, meet an old person, learn something from them. You know, the other day with some sisters, we visited my mother. Okay? And, uh, <laughs> hey, we learned many things. Well, to the our mambo. Even, you know, we had gone at, to see our mothers and we invited our husbands. Now, it turned to be a husband day because my mother just talked about how we should treat the husbands. Tomarugere, tomarorevega, na 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 na. They were so happy. Now, we are learning from her, and we must have an attitude that this woman, as old as she is, she has something to teach us. It's a culture you develop in how you relate with those older ones. Amen? That's why the Bible says if you find an older person, you salute them. And she gave us wisdom, isn't it, Salome? She gave us wisdom on many, many things. Many, many. I, in fact, some things my mother said, I, have, I just, I was shocked. <laughs> like there is one, she talked about, the, was it the pillow or what was it? <laughs> anyway, that's for another day. But I realized we can learn from her, but I have to have an attitude of learning. So whenever you see people above you, even if they are not your spiritual authority, have an attitude that there is something I can learn from this one. The attitude of learning or discipleship. Number four, is it number four? The attitude of openness and vulnerability, especially to your spiritual father. is a way to relate with them. Relate with your father especially in a way that you are vulnerable. Vulnerable, open. You should be an open book. Let not be there some hidden things that you hide. You know, I read about Paul in the book of Acts, I think. Uh, the book of, is it the book of Acts? I can't remember which verse, but I think it's the book of Acts. It's actually Paul who circumcised Timothy. Now I want to ask you, how did Paul know that Timothy was not circumcised? It must be that it is true. Give, give us that verse. He knew his nakedness. This is what I mean. Do not, especially if it's a good father, be vulnerable so that you can be helped. It's an attitude. Relate, especially with your spiritual father, in a way that you're vulnerable. Tell them, I don't know how to manage money. I beat my wife. <laughs> be vulnerable. Let you be circumcised in your heart. There is nothing wrong with that. Now, if they are good fathers also, they will not expose you. They will circumcise you, but in private too, because they don't want to expose you. Be vulnerable. That's how you relate with spiritual fathers. Don't fear. And if you are a good spiritual father also, just accept and help them. But some of us, kuna vituko, yani kuna kituko, unaweza sikia mutu alifanya, na unashindwa haia. You should say those things. Be vulnerable. 
Even if you mess some time, if you have a spiritual father, open up to them. Tell them, this is what I did. You are more truthful than us discovering you did that. You know, it's a culture of vulnerability so that if we see you veering off, then we can bring you back because we are there to shepherd you. So don't hide anything. Say, I stole money. What will you do? Utadu? Niliba. Sindio. There are people who have come to discover who they are much later. Then I doubt them. But if you tell me your things, I'll keep them confidentially. And even if somebody comes to tell me, unajua ule, alitoka hiyo church, alikuwa mefanya hivi, nina yasema ni sawa, nina ju. Nina ju. That's how you relate with me. Let me tell you, if you have a good father, it doesn't, just because fathers represent our heavenly father, it doesn't matter what mess you went through. If you have a good father, they will take care of you. They'll take care of you. Be vulnerable. It's okay. That's how you relate with fathers. Be vulnerable to them. Even if you kill, come and say, you, I killed somebody. We shall go and say, he didn't kill. It's like, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's true. It's like, it's like your mother. When we were young, you would come to report to us and we'll be hiding behind our mothers. And you will say, oh, what we have done. And my mother will say, ah, nisawa, eh, eh, nisawa. Lakini siyo ni kama watoto wangu walifanya hivyo. But by the time umetoka kwa hiyo mulango, zile blows tutakuwa tumepata, I am telling you. But, uh, but you, my mother will not allow you to beat me or destroy me, but she will do it herself. Why? Because we are vulnerable. It's a relationship we must establish. Number what? Which other one? Five. Number five, loyalty. We must practice loyalty. And I'll come to that in the second when I'm teaching about covenant relationships. Loyalty. Loyalty. Many of us are so disloyal. Loyalty. Especially sticking with them in hard times. I want to read a scripture. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 9 to 22. Let me read it. Second Timothy chapter 4 verse 9. Second Timothy chapter 4. Yeah. Be diligent to come to me quickly. I want you to see what Paul is saying to Timothy. Be diligent to come to me quickly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica, Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he's useful to me for my ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. He says, bring the clock that I left with Kappas at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith, these are all people that were sons to him, did me much harm. May the Lord, up and your Paul, amekasirika. Here he must have been angry. I'm sure he reversed that later. May the Lord do what? According to? Aya. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, he says, he's writing to Timothy, no one stood with me. That means most of the sons were disloyal. But all forsook me. But here he prays a better prayer. He says, may it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me. Let me tell you, even though the Lord will stand with us, God will come and stand with us in person when you don't stand with us as fathers. If they stood with him at his first defense, he didn't need to say. You know what I mean? God stands with you through people. But when you're left so lonely, be loyal. It's a culture of loyalty. It's a culture of loyalty. Amen? Amen. Sometimes it's hard when you have spiritual sons to preach like that because some people think you are telling them, but this is the word of God. We must preach the whole counsel of God. Stand with your fathers. Be found when things were bad for them. Stand with them. Many people are quick to leave their spiritual authority when they are found in problems, even before they establish the truth. Many people, by the way, they quickly. Nkisikia Dr. Lucy aliiba. Iyo debora ingine ya mutakuja. Na mujui kama niliiba ama si kuiba. 
In fact, that's why we are losing so many ministers. Because the people can simply not stand with them. Stand with them. That's why the Bible also says, do not receive an accusation against an elder unless with a witness of can't just take Mushene from one person. Stand with them. Don't forsake them. They might have forsaken Paul because he was not easy to live with, but uh, stand with them. Number four, number whatever. Culture of faithfulness. Culture of faithfulness. Number seven, culture of truthfulness. Culture of truthfulness, being truthful, being truthful. Paul tells, calls Timothy, my true son. First Timothy chapter one, verse two. Don't be fake. Don't even relate with them for different uh, uh, purpose. True sons. You know, by the way, what an in one and I know other fathers who are here, or those who have people under them. We know who is true to us and who is not. We know. Yeah. Mom, now, what, what, what resource do you get from fathers? Let's finish at fathers and then take tea. What resource? And this I'm teaching, I'm not actually teaching father-son relationship. That I'm teaching in our church or we have taught in our church. This is really running uh, through on relationship. Why, what resource do you get from fathers? Number one, covering. It's a resource. You need a covering. A covering. Number two, impartation of grace and giftings. Number three, doctrine. Right? Those are the main three things. And number four, identity, which I don't want to talk about. Especially if a spiritual father gives you identity. Identity, covering, impartation of grace and giftings, doctrine. What breaks the father-son relationship? What breaks father-son relationships? Number one, familiarity. Familiarity. Make sure you don't come to a place. If you are familiar, that's not a good relationship because that person stops being your resource. Familiarity. You must take care of familiarity. And how we do that is by keeping a safe distance. All right? Keep a safe distance. Familiarity number two. Dishonor. Especially when we expose them. When we expose their nakedness. Familiarity. Keep a distance. That's why even the priest, there was always a distance. Keep a distance. Try as much as possible to keep a distance. That doesn't mean... You, you understand what I mean? Keep a distance with your people that you honor and respect. Keep a distance. Dishonor is another thing that breaks father-son relationship. And wrong motive and expectations. There are many people that misunderstand the role of spiritual fathers, for example. And when I talk about distance or familiarity, even your boss at work, my own boss whom I love a lot, I love him. God told me at work, he, he became a father in me in this profession. And through that, he has lifted me so, so much that many people think he favors me. You know the way that thing of favoring? But to me, the way I looked at him, I looked at him as one God put to help me grow professionally. And sometimes he will deal with me harder than the way he deals with others because he also has a lot of expectations from me. For the Bible says the son whom father loves, he chastises. He puts discipline. And he has helped me to be disciplined. One of the things he taught me is to be confident. Yeah? And many times when I'll give you an example. Just to show it's not just about father son in the church. It's people who are above you. How you tap grace from them. So one time when I got this, the current position where I am, we had another counterpart. We are like two. And uh, the other one is from another country, and this one is proudly Kenyan. <laughs> so, si tunajivunia kuwa wa Kenya, kwa nini mmecheka, hee, hebu ambia jirani yako najivunia kuwa mkenya. 
So this other one at that point was not very welcoming because this was a new position and it meant this position coming in, it's like you are taking part of their power. So what I used to do all the time was to run to my boss, oh, alifanya, oh, alifanya, eh, alienda, eh, alinifungia, and my boss was doing nothing. And I was very frustrated, and I wondered why. You know what he told me one day? Dr. Lucy, I know you say the meek shall inherit the earth. He knows the Bible because he knows I'm a preacher. But I want to tell you, authority is not given, it is taken. That was his answer. I said, okay. And I walked out. <laughs> now, in marketplace, there is no way I was going to fit in until I know how to assert my power and authority also. Because that position requires you to do that. Then now I grew. He wasn't teaching me to be arrogant, but I cannot be every time. Go, 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 go. I'm a Nijapa. Go, go, go. I'm a Miwa. Go, go, go. I'm a Miwa. I said, but no. Find your space. Define yourself. So that day I walked, I said, I never go back to him again. So when that person came to tell me, nye, 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 I said, I'm not doing. She went down. You know what Bo said? You are my deputy, she's my deputy. Both of you are deputies. Good. <laughs> you sit. Do you now understand what I mean? Yeah, the, so he's a father. He's helping me. I cannot be... I'm a, I cannot be tasked with the responsibility to oversee so many people, but yet I cannot be able to make decisions on my own. That's what he is trying to help me. And the truth is, I'm very loyal to him. Even if you speak evil about him, I will not agree. Because he's a father in that context. That's what I'm talking about. Amen? All right. So, faithfulness. Have I talked about faith, uh, imp covering, impartation of grace and gifts? Doctrine. Then I've talked about familiarity, dishonor. Number three, wrong motive and expectation. There are people that we are fathering who think that our father's responsibility is to give them money. Many people have wrong expectations. You have a birthday, you want us to come. You give birth, you want us to come. And it, you will kill fathers. You are like me when I was a coco coco. I'm a nijapa, coco coco. I'm a new one. Some of us need to know how to stand. You know, we were discussing with Pastor James and say, all our sons say the sons that relate to us. There are many. Say they are more than 50. And each of them want us to preach in their churches on Sunday. How many Sundays are there in a year? 52. That means we are not in Fountain Gate. For 52, to make a da. Jihubirieni, jibarikini. No, I'm saying, anyway, that's just, it doesn't mean we don't go. But really, if we went to every church, we'll not marry. So that's a wrong expectation from their side. Not even conferences. We can't come to every conference. It's a wrong expectation. So who is a father to you? What do we expect from them? Many people have left fathers because of wrong expectations. Don't have wrong expectations. Spiritual fathers are not there to pamper you. To tell you, hi, 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 you are okay. Because, you know, the role of the father is to make you raise your standards. It's not to write you good birthday messages, even though we do. Many of us do not want to hear the truth from the father. You see, a father should be somebody who you are safe with. Do you know, whenever we preach, <laughs> he will tell you how you preached and what you did. For example, you extended time. Why? Because he's helping me to be disciplined. But now if you say, I'll never preach again because he, uh, you'll never. 
wrong expectation. What do you expect? I want you as you go today to ask yourself, for those of you that have spiritual authority over your life, what do you expect them to do for you? What do you expect? What's your expectation? Then ask yourself, is it the right or the wrong expectation? Because if you have the wrong expectation, you're going to be very, very disappointed. But if you have the right expectation, the right expectation is this one I've given you. One, gifting and graces. Three, covering. Four, doctrine. Five or four, identity. So keep familiarity away. Keep dishonor away. Wrong motive and expectation. And finally, independence. Now, I want you to go and study these models. I will not share them, but I want you to go and study them. Number one, Moses and Joshua is a good father-son relationship. Ruth and Naomi is a good father-son relationship. Elisha and Elijah is a good father-son relationship. Esther and Mordecai is a good father-son relationship. And Timothy and Paul is a good father-son relationship. Let me repeat them. Moses and Joshua. And you can know that the strength of Joshua was the service he offered to Moses. Ruth and Naomi, it was the pursuit. Ruth pursued Naomi. And the covenant, actually more of the covenant. He said, your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. It was a covenant, like marriage. Elisha and Elijah, Elisha, you know, pursued Elijah. Esther and Mordecai, the strength of Esther was submission. Even when she went into the palace, it's submission. But the greatest strength of Esther is that she lifted her father. In fact, in all those things, at the end, the ultimate is Mordecai who sat on that seat. And that's a key to relating with fathers is to lift them. Number five, Timothy and Paul. And the best, the key there is impartation. Impartation. The example of Timothy and Paul is a much impartation that Paul had on Timothy's life. So Timothy allowed that impartation. Esther, it was the lifting of the father to sit on the seat. Elisha was the pursuit. Ruth and Naomi was the covenantal relationship. And Moses and Joshua was the service. And we won't dwell on that because of time. May the Lord help us. Amen. May the Lord do what? Help us. If you can align your relationship. Fathers are a resource. People above you are a great resource. If you can align your relationship, you'll be able to tap. In fact, you become better than they are many times. The joy of a good father, the joy of a good mentor, the joy of a good overseer is to see people that are below him rise up and even overtake him in terms of the manifestation. Because a father is manifested in the sons. Just like God. That's why Jesus said he was not scared. What did he say? Greater things. Did he say that? He said greater things. Who will do? You are not answering me. Oh. Why did Jesus tell them? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He did. He, he, he healed the paralytic. He opened the blind eyes. But what did he tell them? He said greater things you will do. That's the joy. So when you align your relationship, a father becomes a resource and what you produce manifests greater in you than the person that is passing that to you. And that's the joy. So in other words, you should become better than, than, than your father in terms of their manifestation. But that is dependent on how much. That's why Moses would not make them enter the promised land. Who did? Who did? How many miracles did Elisha do? Twice. Elijah, true or false? Where did, who sat on the throne first? Was it Esther or was it Mordecai? It was Esther. What about Ruth? She became greater. Do you understand? So a good father-son relationship helps the son to become greater in terms of manifesting what the father should have been. But that has to do with how you sanctify and align your relationships in the correct way. Does that help you? Let's stand up and pray. Lift up those hands. I want you to pray about your relationship with those above you. 
and especially your spiritual authority, your spiritual covering, whatever you call them, it doesn't matter. But there are people that are above you. I want you to sanctify the relationship, to hold them in a we, to sanctify that relationship so that grace, giftings can flow to your life. Thank you, Father. We bless you. Thank you, Lord. In your own wisdom, in your own way, you made sure there are people that are above us. And Lord, we ask you, sanctify those relationships. Okay, I don't want us to be religious. Look at me, then we will pray. I want you to pray for so many of us, especially those of us that have worked with someone above us for a long time. Sometimes that relationship is tainted uh, because of things. And uh, when it is tainted, what happens is grace cannot flow. It's like a river. If there is a river and the river has dirt, that's, that dirt is going to clog the water from flowing. And I feel that at a very personal level, you as an individual, you know yourself, I want you to sanctify your relationship with the person that you know. God has put over your life. Whoever they are, I don't know them. And whatever you call them, some of us call them fathers, others is pastor, whatever you call them, but you do know them that are above you. I want you to sanctify. Some of us who work, like me, need also to align our relationship with those people. That's how grace flows. Grace flows in a culture of honor. And some of the relationships need to be sanctified. And sometimes our relationships are not sanctified because we saw our father's nakedness. We saw their weakness. And every time we see them, we see them in that light. And now grace never flows. Never flows. So we want to pray that God will help us sanctify those relationships. God will renew them. And if there are things that you need to deal with, deal with them. Deal with them as a person. This is very personal very personal. And for some of you, you'll be healed. Some of you, breakthroughs will come to your life. Some of you, ministries will be released. Many things will happen to you. This is the time to sanctify those relationships. Amen. Amen. Lift up those hands, even as we pray. It's, very, it's a very personal prayer. Pray it. Pray it. Thank you, Father. If there is any way I've dishonored my Father, I pray. Those whom you've put over my life, even my boss, even my parents, and anybody else. God, I ask you, sanctify, especially our spiritual fathers, those that you have put to rule over us spiritually. We, we, we sanctify. We sanctify. Where there has been difficulties, disagreement, heartaches, offense, we sanctify that today in the name of Jesus. We want our relationship to be sanctified so that Father, your grace can flow to us. Your word can flow to us. Giftings, mantles can be left for us. We refuse to have anything that is in between and in between us, God. Sanctify those relationships. Today we understand those are resources that we can tap into. We can tap grace. We can tap doctrine. We can tap, we can tap blessing and covering and, and uh, many other resources that come to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father.